I, I think I'll have time for one question and a and, and answer, quick answer before we get to the one minute silence. Uh, just um, going back to uh, sectors uh, and the impact on different sectors, we've already heard about the effects on the hospitality and leisure sector. We've heard about the effect that that's having on people working in those sectors. Um, how, uh, perhaps starting with Torsten, how should the government support the hard hit sectors, uh, in, in particular hospitality and leisure, and any others that you think that need particular attention and differentiated uh, responses? Um, actually, I'll try and give a, um, a quick answer given the time constraint. So one, recognize that these are very different. So if you look at all, if you, it's not just like the abstract, looking at the output falls by sector or expected output falls, you see this big variation. If you look at what firms are actually saying right now, manufacturers, 36% of them are saying, and there are less of them were closed in the first place. Of those that are closed, 36 say they expect to reopen in the next two weeks. If you look at um, accommodation of food, it's only 12%. And if you look at recreation and the arts, it's 4%. So these are huge differences by sector. Uh, so a one size fits all policy in general is not going to work. Um, so far, we've been dealing with that um, largely by for the small parts of the hospitality and retail sector. So the grants, I think Paul mentioned earlier, so there are some se sectors that have had grants rather than loans, which are basically small businesses with properties. Are the, are the main area where the grant has been a big part of the policy response. So small cafes have received uh, grants to keep them going through the to pay their rent basically um, during these times. So you can you can do uh, we have done some elements of that. I think as we move the, the main thing is obviously to support the the workers insofar as lots of these companies um, uh, are able to get through if you take their wage bills off them. That is not going to be true for everybody. And if we look at the places where we can see the biggest hits, clearly uh, if you, it's in general, it's a combination of areas that previously had weak labor markets. Um, and Chair, I'll shut up as soon as you need to do your minutes. Yeah, I thank you, Tolston, um, for your understanding. I think at, at this point, order, order, we will uh, suspend the committee uh, to observe the uh, one minute silence in memory of George Floyd. Order, order. Currently suspended. Torsten, I think you were uh, mid-answer to your uh, from the, the, the with the question from Rushanara. Thank you. Um, so I'll just make I'll make two other points because others will have lots of other uh, better points to make. So on on the timing, I think for the sectors that are most effective affected, one of the key issues is that the uh, the level of uncertainty they face about the level of future demand for their services, and that uncertainty. So it's not just that. It, during this pay phase of extended social distancing, they will have smaller demand, which they will, so the sector will shrink. It is that the uncertainty about the eventual level of that demand, where it will settle, is particularly high. And I think giving those sectors more time to realise what that demand, how, where it will settle, is desirable. We don't want premature, which is why the Chancellor is right not to have gone for very high employer contributions to the job retention scheme from August. They need, the sectors need time to adjust to the opening up to see hopefully there's more demand than they might fear. And then to get to the highest level they can get to given the constraints of social distancing as basically we all change our behaviors. So first of all, they need time. And the second issue I would highlight, and this is by far, these are, this is not a comprehensive answer, is, is rent. So rent adjustment. So in general, the rents you pay in an economy are obviously based on the income of the business or indeed of the families for private for um, housing costs for families. The, um, so it's based on the income. Now, in general, we don't have a great system for business rents adjusting in the face of income shocks, particularly if they happen this quickly. Mm. Um, so uh, there's a number of elements to that. Like one, lots of, lots of um, leases are um, upward only rent reviews, which doesn't make a lot of sense in the face of a crisis like this. In, there's, you can see um, you can see uh, sub the way this is happening at the moment is that businesses are basically putting themselves into like versions of administration and then using that as a mechanism to renegotiate their rents. That probably works for some big chains and others, not least if you've got good lawyers, for example. In general, providing better ways, for example, income con like moving to revenue. We talked about income contingent loans, moving to revenue contingent rents during a crisis like this would make a lot of sense and the government could provide more clarity about the regime under which that could happen. Because what landlords are worried about is accepting permanently lower rents, 
Yeah. Yeah. Whereas what we need to do is then encourage them to accept temporarily lower rents because the possible in revenue that can be generated by a given site has just gone through the floor and they need to share some of that pain with the people, the tenants. And okay. that, that would make a big difference. All right. Um, just, just quickly for you, um, on, I mean, there's a comparisons with Germany where they seem to have been returning pretty much um, to a near normal level. What is it that Germany is doing better than we are? And do they, do they provide a line of sight for our hospitality and tourism sector? Um, it's very no, briefly because I want to come to other, other yes, contributors. Well, my really quick answer is that I, I, I'm slightly nervous about some of the headlines saying Germany is completely back to normal. So yes, it's true that booking levels at restaurants yep. uh, went back up to previous booking levels, but that's partly because we're all booking now. It, eating levels have not gone back to previous eating levels and um, for the economy what matters is eating levels not your booking levels so one thing the germans have done great fine we all like saying the germans are brilliant but let's not overstate how much they're back to normality people are not eating in the level they were well they may be eating they're not eating out at the level they were uh pre-crisis in general the reason why the germany has, has seen a relatively benign opening up is because their health risks have gone down uh, significantly yep. quicker as we said before there's not a trade-off between the health and the wealth side of this oh, absolutely okay um paul and Gemma, uh, uh and can you just talk a bit more about what leveling up in this context means in the wake of covid what what does it what should government be doing uh to promote that agenda and how is it different from what's going on we talked a lot about the need for investment i mean uh, earlier on, there was a reference to infrastructure investment, which could be in the hundreds of billions. Uh, we've got the spectre of one million young people who are going to face unemployment. We've got people uh, out in, in, in the streets demonstrating against racial injustice, uh, something that the government, in my view, uh, is not waking up to the reality of. Uh, and we've seen very high death rates among black and Asian people and poorer white people in fact, in terms of the class differentials. So what does that really mean? Does it mean anything now? Paul? Um, so le le levelling up um, itself was, of course, um, really focused on geographic um, inequality. So I'll start with that and come back to some of the wider ones. Um, it's not obvious, actually, that this um, crisis will widen geographic inequalities in the sense of inequality between London and and the Midlands or the North um, in mm. terms of overall particularly labour market performance as I was saying earlier actually some of the more um, uh, more prosperous areas are have more um, of the relatively low paid hospitality and uh, retail uh, jobs. It's also the case, actually, that um, some of the more prosperous local authorities are more dependent on some of the um, uh, some of the income streams which have uh, reduced. So parking charges and charges for going to, uh, le leisure facilities and so on are more important in in the southeast than they are uh, on average in most of the north, outside of the very tourist uh, focused uh, areas. Um, and uh, and more prosperous local authorities are more dependent on council tax, where you may have more people who are no longer able to pay uh, their full council tax. Um, so there, there there are there are a number of reasons for thinking the short term impact may not uh, it, it may exacerbate inequalities within areas and between the rich and the poor and between ethnic groups. But it, I I don't think it need be the case that it increase inequalities. Um, between uh, areas uh, or regions, um, so that's uh, that, that that that's part of the issue. So, so secondly, on on the um, uh, on on the kind of leveling up agenda more broadly, I think um, th that means uh, that the underlying issues probably haven't changed um, enormously. It may be uh, that if we move to a world in which this sort of interaction becomes more common actually being in London uh, for example may be less important to doing the sorts of jobs that are currently based um, in London so it is possible and I put it no stronger than that that some of the agglomeration effects that uh, benefit London and the southeast could um, be more widely spread 
all of that would imply that the most important um, focus for investment then might be more associated with broadband and the capacity to work online than the traditional hard uh, investment that, that we've usually thought about um, in the past. Let, let me stress again, I am speculating about the future here and I'm not saying that this is definitely where it will go, but it, the, the, these, these sorts of things may be point in that, uh, point in that direction. Um, other issues around um, uh, leveling up uh, in terms of education in particular, which I think is probably under uh, focused on relative is, um, uh, is, is going to be especially important. We know that the, you know, what is the biggest difference between the richest and poorest parts of the country? It's the number of people with high levels of education, uh, which reflects the availability of jobs um, in Thank those you. areas. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Gemma just just to uh, pick up do pick up on the points um, around leveling up if you want to. But I, I wanted to dig deeper into inequalities. Do you think uh, obviously we can see existing inequalities playing out in terms of death rates and so on? Do you think that there are new inequalities that are emerging? We, you know, we, all of you talked about some of the impacts on uh, uh, those in particular sectors. Uh, we've seen gaps in terms of government intervention. Uh, new starters, for instance, haven't been supported uh, and they're crying out for help. Young people, you've mentioned, uh, are being hit very hard, uh, the self-employed and, and others. So many uh, millions who are still left out. Does that create a, a big gulf between those who have got support and those who haven't and where the government's not listening? Is that going to create much more friction and um, a sense of grievance, if you like, because the government hasn't really equally supported everybody in need? And what does that mean for inequalities going forward post-COVID? Yeah, I will start and then I... You should definitely ask uh, Paul and Torsten this as well, because I know IFS and Resolution have done a lot of work on inequalities at this time as well. I mean, to pick up on a few of your points, um, Paul was talking about earlier, I uh, don't think that's my phone, um, having not been covered by um, the support packages, are not tend to be relatively high income groups um, in some ways. So one of the groups that was highlighted was the self-employed people with profits over 50,000 pounds a year. That's clearly a pretty high income group, tends to be made up of people like partners in law firms and firms of accountants. Um, so to the extent that those sorts of, and similarly company owner managers, some of those people have been taking very high levels of income in dividends from companies. Um, so to the extent that those groups have been left out, that may be, uh, reducing rather than exacerbating some previous inequalities. Um, I think one of the groups you talked about that we probably are particularly worried about is young people, both at the tail end of so their education and going into the labour market, um, who are likely to be badly affected by the poor state of the economy at the moment. And um, IFS and others' previous work has shown that that can have lasting, scarring effects on people's earnings opportunities of going into a poor labour market. Um, and at the moment, there's not much uh, that's being done to help those people apart from uh, being eligible for slightly higher levels of uh, universal credit if they're not able to find a job. Um, so I think there is a chance that this could um, increase inequalities, um, but I'm not sure that it's mainly to do with the gaps in the existing um, support schemes. It's probably... Um, more to do with the fact that existing inequalities have meant that people have had a worse experience of this crisis, and that includes people that Torsten was talking about before, who live in much more cramped living conditions, which means that those children are finding it harder to learn um, through the schooling that's being provided to them. They're more like, likely to be at risk of transmission of the disease because they're just living in much closer confines with other people. You're describing, you're describing much of the experience of my constituents in terms of these multiple factors that with the fourth highest age adjusted death rate in the country. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna come to Giles. Very, if Giles, do you wanna contribute very quickly and then I'll, I'll go back to others. No, I, I, I don't have very much to add there, but I, just every single feature of this disease seems to be um, diabolically prejudiced against certain disadvantaged groups from the health effects to the nature of the work they're in to the, their prevalence on the frontline staff. So I, I strongly agree with your concern that, it, that this kind of a disease 
does seem at least in the very short term to make it very very difficult to deal with and otherwise i would also add on, on leveling up as you asked earlier it, it was meant to be a geographical statement but i it really is just a slogan the government went into the election campaign with this phrase that they thought worked very well, but they had not got round to working out really what it meant or how to go about doing it before coronavirus came. So right now it's still quite a big blank and, and maybe an opportunity to provide them with some better content. Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, to Torsten and Paul, we know that the, there, there's differential effects on those at the bottom end of the income bracket. Uh, there's a big issue around gender, as well as race. Can you tell us more about what assessments you've done on the differential effects? Um, I know Resolution Foundation's done work around ch childcare and, and gender, but also around the high income earners who are saving more, for instance, uh, than low income. So we're, we're having different experiences of COVID. What does that mean for inequalities? Have we lost, are we losing out hard, from hard won battles or going into reverse? Uh, and what are the impl policy implications of that? What should government be doing? Uh, and uh, another angle is around youth unemployment. Um, is there a case for giving young people a minimum job, uh, a sort of income guarantee? Uh, there's nothing for them at the moment. Uh, it's likely to cost between 1.5 to 2 billion, probably, if we gave every young person a minimum wage. We could use the 600 million or so un uh, un unused money from the apprenticeship scheme to provide an income for young people so that they can make a contribution positively to society. Why isn't, well, do you think the government should be being much more bold about those groups? Um, okay, shall I, shall I kick off with the, the yeah. what we know? I mean, the, the honest thing to say is there was, we're, we're three months into this crisis, so I can tell you what's happening on the inequality aspects so far, yeah. and then we move into speculation about what the effect over the whole period is. So, some, so I'm running through those issues in turn, the ones you've raised. So if I look at amongst earners, there is a very clear split about bottom lower earners are bearing bigger economic risks and bigger health risks so they are the ones losing the jobs are being furloughed more likely um uh, and they are the ones who are more likely to be key workers and therefore facing ongoing risks and that isn't just about what happened in the lockdown itself that will be also true as we see the opening up where they have less control and ability to continue working from home uh, and controlling their level of health risks so it's not just about who faces what level of health risk, it's who's got control of their level of health risks over the field. So I think that is, low earners thing is very clear in all the survey data um, so far. Then on age, it is definitely the younger workers, so particularly the very youngest, 18 to 24, that are facing the biggest um, uh, uh, job losses and furloughing to date. Other than the very youngest, you've basically got a U-shape uh, where it's the over 60s and the people in their 20s who've got slightly higher risks of furloughing and job losses than people in the middle of the age uh, age range. Um, it, but it isn't. that's about the current young workers. I think this point about future young workers, people coming into the labour market, is really crucial. They're not going to be supported by any of the... All of our income support schemes are supporting previous incomes, not potential future incomes. And so, yeah, I mean, we published a report a few weeks ago saying that even if we see the kind of unemployment increase that we're expecting and that the effect on young people mirrors that of previous recessions, for young people without degrees, we would expect even three, four years into this, them to be seeing a 30% effect on their employment rate. So really big. On income inequality, again, this is the area where there's less data, but we published a report today saying a few things. One, that the income hit across the income distribution, so everybody in and out of work and in households, not as individuals, is more evenly spread across the income distribution than the earnings hit. And so, so the way of thinking about that is that the bottom of the income distribution is less reliant on labour income than the middle and the top. Yep. And therefore they have seen, because this is a labour market crisis, they have seen less of a hit immediately yep. than the earning than you might think from looking at the low earners being hit hardest and there are low earners in the middle and the top of the distribution too because they're second earners in households so first point uh, if you look just at incomes then it looks like maybe it's not so bad everyone's just taking having a really bad time but and the danger of thinking about it just like that is the other half of the household budget is obviously what you spend mm. and if we look at who has been able to reduce their spending in the face of those big income hits it is incredibly top heavy. So yep. you see huge savings rates amongst the top half of the distribution, much lower rates amongst the bottom half. And the, if you take that and the income change together, 
it means that if you it means that the measures of financial distress are at the bottom of the income distribution but they're not showing up in the income stats they'll be showing up in the other measures of spending and how you think about family budgets and that's going to feed through to the bottom taking on more debt while the top is able to increase its um, uh, savings significantly. Paul, thank you very much Paul and if you can pick up on some of the points that haven't been picked up I'd be grateful. I'll uh, I'll try there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of points to um, there's a lot of points to get through. <laughs> Gender, um, gender, gender and youth, perhaps. Yeah. What should we be doing? Absolutely. So I think the, I mean, you, you know, we've we've got um, in in terms of gender um, in, inequalities. I mean, I think um, we thought, I think beforehand, that um, women would be more likely to be unemployed, fairly unemployed than uh, men because of the sectors that they work in. But I think the indications from the Resolutions Foundation's work, at least, is that that's not so much the case as you'd expect, but among mothers, um, we really are finding uh, that uh, from our own surveys, that they are more likely to be losing their job and reducing their hours and reducing the number of hours in which they are focused solely on work uh, than our fathers. And so you might expect that to have uh, potentially a long run effect on um, their labour market um, outcomes uh, and, and wages because we know that uh, time spent out of the labour market or working part-time can be significantly uh, negative effects. We know that among um, ethnic minorities that there are some groups um, who, for example, uh, who Pakistani and Bangladeshi uh, men are much more likely than others than work in shutdown sectors and some of them are much more likely to be self-employed um, uh, many black groups are disproportionately represented in key worker um, occupations. So we really are seeing quite, really quite stark differences actually uh, by, uh, by ethnic minority groups as, uh, as well as some of those gender um, differences. In terms of um, younger people and, um, and generational um, inequality, I think we've got, uh, you know, a, I, as I've said earlier, I think a significant issue is what happens to young people moving into the labour market at this point. I think there are one or two other things it's worth saying. It's not necessarily all going in the wrong direction. I mean, fathers are spending more time with their children during this crisis. Maybe but that's something... We that we sorry to push you, but what should we do about it? What should we do to make sure that their opportunities into the world of work is enhanced with government support? Because at the moment, there's nothing for them. What would you do? If you were a government minister, what would you do, Paul? Sorry, for young people, you mean? Yes, yeah, for, for young people. Um, uh, and the other groups, if you can, if you can think of um, ways forward, uh, policy. Yeah. Sorry, Paula, I'll need a fairly quick answer. I'm sorry to press you. Your no, wish. I don't have a lot to say, so that's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, at, at least maintaining numbers of apprenticeships at where they are, and I think that's going to require some significant support for employers. I think is 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 is, is one part of the answer. I think uh, re reinventing some of the. Um, employment support schemes we've had in the past where you actually provide employers you know, with reasonably significant um, case for a future jobs fund equivalent future, well, indeed future jobs fund which actually quite well evaluated I mean that was brought out in the last crisis and I think the evaluations of it were really quite yeah. positive so we have some we actually do have some success uh, some success, success stories to to learn from from previous crises great thank you very much thank you Rishanarga